Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here. I see some friends here and uh, family members. I'm blessed to have my family, a lot of my family here this morning. We have uh, past minister, Brother Costello, here. We're glad to see him. And it's good to see Sister Charlotte here. And uh, we, we talked a little bit this morning about how uh, we're all missing Frank uh, this morning. Uh, he was our long time song leader, and, uh, and she wanted to keep the tradition alive by being here this morning. And so we appreciate seeing Charlotte here in our midst and to uh, and the legacy of faith. And really, what this church is and has are, are stories of faith, stories of faith and family, and we celebrate that, and so today it gives me a great honor to say, welcome home. Welcome home. I know that there are many, many memories uh, that many of you have of, of time here, of family members coming to Christ, coming to faith, being baptized, getting married in this building, and so we just are grateful to see you, and we celebrate those stories this morning with you, those stories of faith. And uh, we're grateful to have the Nashville Youth Chorus with us, and they will be singing next door. And uh, so that'll be something wonderful to enjoy after the service here and while we're eating some good food together. And oh yeah, we've got food. So uh, hang on. Uh, We're going to have some food after service. So this morning, I wanted to talk to you about one of the most hallmark teachings of Jesus. It's a teaching that the world knows whether they know Christ. And it's a teaching that's a hallmark. It's fundamental to the Christian faith. And a lot of times we say it like this, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Or as Jesus said it in Matthew 7, 12, therefore whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And when we hear those words, we've heard it. We've heard our mother or our father or our teacher or someone tell us that, haven't we? Because it's one of the most sublime and easiest teachings of Christ to be able to understand. Do you want someone to do this to you? Well, don't do it. Or, do you want someone to do this for you? Then then do it. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's common sense, isn't it? Do you think that we've gotten to a point sometimes to where maybe common sense isn't so common anymore? Such a fundamental teaching, but when we look at people's lives, when we look at the news, when we look at Friends and neighbors, when we look at marriages, do we see that golden rule? Or do we see something else? Because ultimately the golden rule is not about self, isn't it? It's about others. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Common sense. Common sense is rare in these days. Let me just give you a for instance. The penny. The penny, the oldest and the most common coin in our currency. That actually 30 million pennies are made a day. How many, I wonder how many pennies are in the pockets of everybody here. Probably not that many. But 30 million pennies a day are made by the men. 1,040 pennies every second. Every second, 1,000 pennies coming at you. Boy, that's a lot of pennies, isn't it? The U.S. Mint produces 13 billion pennies a year. Where are all those pennies? I need some of those. They're in your couch, right? (laughs) But the odd thing about the penny is, is this, is that it actually costs more to produce them than they're worth. Do you get that? that a penny actually costs more to produce than actually the penny itself. It costs 1.7 cents 
to make the penny. Now, does that make any sense to you? And really what we're talking about with the golden rule is value, aren't we? About values, about what we believe. And what the world values is the temporal, the immediate, and the surface level. And that's why we find ourselves in a state of lawlessness in this world. That if you looked into the pages of the Bible, it would look like Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5, in the days of Noah, when every thought and imagination of man was on what? Evil continually. Or maybe like the days of the judges, when there was no king, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Isn't that what we see? Our values are all mixed up. Our priorities are mixed up. And we come to a strange time, and get this, that we have moral outrage without morality. People will tell you in this day and age that you have your morality, I have my morality, you do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do, but yet we have all this moral outrage that we see in the world. If there is moral outrage, doesn't that mean that there is morality? It does, doesn't it? But yet we, in, in this day and age, we have so much moral outrage, but yet we can't agree that there's even a morality. And what people call this is relativism. Relativism. The truth is relative. You have your truth, I have my truth. But is that true? Is that right? One thing about relativism is, number one, it's unintelligible because you make a truth claim by saying that everything's relative. All things are relative except what? That all things are relative. So it's self-defeating. It's also unlivable. Because at the end of the day, when someone does something wrong against you, you want justice, don't you? I want justice. When we see things that happen like in Las Vegas, or when we see things that happen in church buildings, we say categorically, that's wrong. That's not right. And lastly, it's untenable. But one of the greatest principles of morality that the Lord gave us was the golden rule. Because it makes so much sense. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It makes sense. It makes sense in schools, don't it? When I read the newspapers, I read about children bullying other children. And isn't that a time to say, do unto others as you would have do unto you? Think about in marriage, in homes. Do we need the golden rule in homes? If husbands treated their wives as they wanted to be treated themselves, if, their, if the wives wanted to, if they treated their husbands as they would want to be treated, do you think that it would transform homes if the golden rule was in it? What about in business? What about in work? What about in society? The golden rule is needed more than ever. We take it for granted but yet we don't obey it. We don't do it. One of the greatest illustrations of the value, there's that word, value of the golden rule, it's called a golden rule for a reason, right? One of the greatest illustrations was a man by the name of J.C. Penny. J.C. Penny, there's that word again too, Penny. J.C. Penny was ahead of his time. And in fact, he crafted a mission statement in 1913 for his stores. And guess what his mission statement was built on? The golden rule. In fact, he said this, I'm setting up a business under the name and meaning of the golden rule. I, I was publicly binding myself in my business relations to a principle which had been a real and intimate part of my family upbringing. Our idea was to make money and build business through serving the community with fair dealing and honest value. And guess what? The first J.C. Penney store was not called the J.C. Penney store. 
It was actually called the Golden Rule Store. And because of that, his business flourished because he tried to give customers a fair and just product and service for what they were paying for. In fact, he went on to mentor another man by the name of Sam Walton and change the world. The golden rule. The reason why we look to the golden rule is because of its value. The reason why we call it golden is because inside that rule there's intrinsic worth. In its raw form, gold is valuable, isn't it? And it's the same is true for the golden rule. It is a basis for our morality and ethics and how we treat one another. Why? Why is it so valuable? Because it comes down to the most important thing in our lives, which are the relationships. What's the most important thing in your life? It's the relationships that you have in it. I've seen many people pass from this earth to the next And when I see people pass away in this life, they never ask for their bank statement. They never ask for the deed to their house. They never go car shopping in their last days. But what do they desire to see? They desire to see the people they love. Because ultimately, our lives and our relationships are the things that matter most. And here is the golden rule. It stands there valuable because it speaks to the most important things in our life, and it's the people in our lives. The golden rule is also beautiful because of its simplicity that even a child, you can sit a child down and say, do unto others, and guess what? They understand it. They comprehend it. But yet it's so profound that it can save our world if we truly abide by it. It's also durable. The golden rule will endure because of its truth to our experience. And did you know that gold is the most malleable metal on earth? That means that we can apply the golden rule to any situation in our life. But I've got a few points this morning, and the lesson will be yours, about the golden rule. The first one is, it begins with the word do. A lot of times when we think about what's wrong and right, when we think about morality, we concentrate on the prohibitions. We we concentrate on thou shalt not. But the golden rule says what? It says do. Christ calls each of us to active kindness and goodness. It's not just about sentiment. It's not just about neutrality because a lot of us like to be neutral too, don't we? Well, I'm just going to sit this one out. I'm going to go over here. Y'all handle it. But Jesus says, no, do, act, active kindness, act. And isn't that what the Bible calls us to do? To be hearers of the Word and be doers of that Word. Jesus also, in His Word, and through His brother James, talks about the sin of omission. In James chapter 4, 17, it's therefore to him who knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. There's also the sin of omission. If you know something good to do and you have the opportunity to do it, if you don't do it, the Bible says, what, what have you done? You've sinned. And God has called us to active goodness. And if we look in the context of Luke chapter 6, The context is also talking about those people who are different from us and even our enemies. Secondly, the golden rule is personal. It's about you. It's about me. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. So it's personal. This requires for us to be people of integrity and personal responsibility. I like it the way that Abraham Lincoln said it. And I believe he's on the penny, right? He's on the penny. He was discussing slavery. And listen to what he says. Whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, 
I feel a strong impulse to see it tried out on him personally. That, that changes the discussion, doesn't it? How could anyone argue for something so vile? I'd like to see it tried out on you. And if we think about our morality, if we think about the things that we do and we don't do for each other, won't that golden rule help us to find what's wrong and what's right? It's personal. And this also calls us to be people that are pure in heart, doesn't it? Because ultimately, if it's a personal rule, that means I have to be the one to decipher it, to be able to interpret it, to be able to perceive it. So I need to be pure, don't I? Blessed are they who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Number three, the golden rule is universal. Do unto others. And it doesn't qualify the others, doesn't it? It doesn't say, oh, do to those people who look just like you, or that meet at the same country club as you, or that shop at the same place that you shop. No, it says, do unto others as you would. It doesn't qualify, when, when, just like when Jesus says, thou shalt love thy neighbor. It's unqualified. God calls us to do good and to love all people, no matter their color, no matter their background, no matter their religion, no matter their socioeconomic background. God calls us to do unto others as we would want done unto us. And last, or number four, the golden rule is also very clear, isn't it? So clear that a child can perceive it. It elucidates every part of our life when we begin to think about it. It's clear, and Jesus said, it's also consistent with the law and the prophets. He said, in fact, this is the law and the prophets. That when you begin to look at the commandments that are in God's Word, they're consistent with the golden rule. And lastly, number five, the golden rule is practical. You think about when people talk about lofty ideas, talk about theories of ethics, and we can talk about theories of ethics, we can talk about pragmatism, we can talk about consequentialism, we can talk about Canadian ethics, we can talk, well, what are we even talking about? I don't know. But the thing about the golden rule is, is that it is practical. You can leave this building today and use the golden rule. And I'm going to give you just a few ways to. Number one, pray for people. Prayer makes a difference. Prayer changes our hearts and it changes the world. The Bible calls us to pray without ceasing. The great Charles Spurgeon said, we know not what prayer can't do. We don't know what it can't do. It can do anything if we use it. Another thing that you can do for someone is to encourage them. Think about all the critics in the world. Don't you think the world has enough critics? Aren't there enough people telling you you can't succeed in something or that that dream's too big or... Instead, be an encourager. Encourage people to do the right thing. Encourage. Think about sharing. That's something that we can do for one another. Share. In fact, it says of the early Christians, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. What about understanding? A lot of times we seek people to understand us first, don't we? When we get into a disagreement, well, you better understand me. But actually, we've never taken the time or the inclination to try to understand them. And actually, that's the only thing that we have control of is trying to understand the other person. You don't have control over whether they understand you, do you? I think it was Einstein who said this, the point is not to know, the point is to understand. What about forgiveness? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do in your home, in your work, to let down that grudge and to forgive? And the last thing that we can do for 
as the golden rule is to share the good news of this. The Bible says that the power of God unto salvation is the gospel. And the greatest thing that you can do for someone is give them the blessing of Jesus Christ who transforms our life into what it needs to be. To give them the good news. There's plenty of bad news, isn't there? But to give people the good news that Christ is true and He reigns in His kingdom and you can be a part of that kingdom. The good news of Christ. Because ultimately, Jesus Christ gave us a golden rule that's reflected in the blood of the cross. The crimson red blood of the cross. And think about the richness of His gift that actually Jesus did for you and me what no one else wanted to do, nor anyone else could do. Jesus gave you the opportunity to have life and to have it more abundant and to have salvation. And think about the richness of the golden rule. If you enact the golden rule into your life, your life will become richer because of it. And not only because of the golden rule, but because of Christ. If you put Christ in your life and His teaching, your life will be better for it. I look out into the world and I see no assurances. Do you? I see no assurances anywhere in this world. You can buy all the insurance you want, but you won't get any assurance with it, will you? Last time I checked, when I bought insurance, the guy told me, he didn't tell me, oh, nothing bad's ever going to happen to your house. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. I've got health insurance, but does that give me any assurance that nothing bad's going to happen? No, it's there because something probably will happen that's bad. But in Christ, there is an assurance that's deeper and richer than anything in this world. In fact, Paul said, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Life eternal with Jesus Christ. When I look out into the world, I see the violence and the conflict. But in Christ, I see the richness of peace that Christ offers a peace that this world can't give you. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give I unto you. And also I look at the world and I see hopelessness. But with Christ there is hope. That no matter what happens in this world, I know that Christ is there for me and you. And God will truly take care of us. Do you have that hope? Do you have that peace that Christ offers? If you're not a Christian this morning, we're going to extend the invitation and sing a song to invite you, to encourage you, to think about where you are. Paul said, today is the day of salvation. If you've never obeyed Christ, there's no better time than today than to get it right with the Lord. And as you walk with the Lord, as you obey His commandments, let me tell you, they will become truer and truer. They validate themselves. The Bible says to believe in Him. To believe in Christ because He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. To repent of sins, to turn from those sins. To confess Him to be the Son of the living God. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And to be immersed, baptized into His body, the church. And it says when we do that, our sins are remitted. They're forgiven. They're washed away. And we begin to walk with our Lord. Begin to enact that golden rule when sometimes it's not always easy. Right? But there's a richness to your life that you can't know without Him. Or maybe you are a Christian, you need encouragement or healing, whatever your need is. Won't you come now as together we stand and as we sing?